Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. How are you guys doing? Happy spring! Spring has sprung. I don't know about you guys, but here in LA, the weather is looking up and it's looking beautiful. I hope you guys are getting some sunshine wherever you are and the weather's starting to warm up. I know it's, it's, I know it's not really fair for me to say that in LA, (laughs) things are getting warmer. You don't want to punch me in the face right now, don't you? But no, it's really pretty. So anyway, before we get to my amazing guest this week, I just want to, just want to make sure y'all are following me on Instagram, trying to do some more Instagram lives and IGTVs and just talk a little bit more to you live and in person. So make sure you head over to Instagram and follow me there. I am at the divorce survival guide. And if you are a woman and you're not in my Facebook group, you need to get in there. I haven't sort of plugged my Facebook group in a while, but I just want to say that my Facebook group is different from any other divorce Facebook group out there. And I'm not just saying that because I think so, but it's what they tell me. And I have been in a few of them when I was starting out my group and I was like, whoa, (laughs) this is some scary shit. I monitor the shit out of my Facebook group. I do not allow people to just vent and bash and it is a place for learning and growth. So if you are interested in learning and growth, and if you are interested in being challenged and stretching beyond where you're at right now, then I invite you to join my Facebook group. It's for women only. And you'll find the link in my bio. But if you just go to Facebook and you type in, should I stay or should I go? My picture should pop up and I think it's the same one that's on my podcast art. So you will recognize me, (laughs) I hope. And I invite you to join it. Please be sure you answer all of the screening questions. I will not let you into the group if you do not answer all of the screening questions. Because I take the screening of people very seriously. So the group is not open for divorce professionals. I love you guys, but this is my, you know, this is my space for me to do my work. And um, unless you're my friend, and then you can come and join. So let's talk about today's guest, Dr. Elizabeth Cohen, who can totally join my Facebook group. Dr. Cohen is a clinical psychologist. She is the CEO and founder of the online divorce course and membership Afterglow, the light at the other side of divorce. And she is the CEO of the Center for CBT in New York City. Dr. Cohen's online course teaches women how to heal, grow, and thrive after divorce, no matter how difficult the process has been. Dr. Cohen also has just written a book, and we are talking about that because it is coming out this week. It is so exciting. It has the same name. The book is based on her Afterglow program, and it's called Light at the Other Side of Divorce, Discovering the New You. So without further ado, please help me welcome my dear friend, Dr. Elizabeth Cohen. Dr. Elizabeth Cohen, welcome back. Mm, I'm so happy to be here. It's such a highlight of my of my week. I'm so happy to be here with you. Aw, I adore you. So, oh my God, you have a book coming out. This is so exciting. I know. It's like I had another birth. I was saying, I, I'm like birthing this thing that came. I wrote this book for my, for people who were like me, I don't know if you were going through this during your divorce where I, I, at that time, it was about 11 years ago. I sat on my bed with my laptop. I don't know if I'd taken a shower in days, you know, my kids had finally gone to sleep and I typed in like divorce recovery or divorce healing. And I just, back then I couldn't find anything. And you know what that message told me, Kate, I realized you have no hope. 
like give up. Right. Like, because there is no, like, and so now if someone can see, oh, there's a book written on it. I have an online program. Oh, and they, it's called light at the other side of divorce. Oh, maybe there's some hope. And so I just, I didn't only want to give tools and strategies and help and guidance. I also wanted to give hope because I needed that so much when I was going through it. I love that. That's exactly why I created my program because I, there were no answers, right? When I was going, should I stay or should I go? Should I stay or should I go? I was, you know, Googling, I'm looking for the, <laughs> right. for the burning bush, right? And there were no answers. Yeah. So that's exactly why I created my program, right? To give yeah. people answers. <laughs> yes, to help and to guide. And if there are answers there, then that means you're not alone. Other people are asking the same question, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. So this is amazing. So it's called Afterglow. I think this is like the, a genius title. Afterglow, the light, yeah. the other side of divorce. I love yes. It. By Dr. No, that's <laughs> right. That's me. I know because I really want people to, we still have such a stigma in our culture around divorce. You know, people still walk into my office and say, oh, my daughter went out with this really great person the other day. They're great, except they're from a broken home. I mean, what? This is 2021. We're still calling it. Yeah. What? I hear that on the regular. We're yeah. still calling it a broken home. First We're still calling it a broken home. I mean, what? So we need to shift this tremendously and, and also realize that if you're getting divorced, you've been marinating in those messages for your whole life. And so feeling like a failure, if you're going through a divorce makes sense, given all the messages. So I have a chapter in the book where I talk about challenging assumptions. And I really suggest that we think about, imagine if you thought about your divorce as my relationship has come to its perfect conclusion. It has given me right everything that I needed. And now I'm ready to release it. Like how different would your whole process be if you could see it as something that was completed again, rather than something broken? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so that's in your, is that your, the chapter called divorce is not so bad? Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> I love divorce is not so bad. Yes. Divorce is not so bad. Come on, let's talk about it. Let's figure out why you think it's bad. Like, let's really challenge it. And as a cognitive behavioral therapist, that's what we do. We take these assumptions and we challenge them and say, what evidence do we have? You know, everyone carries these. I mean, this is why your story, my story are so important to share and all the people we know in the world who are talking about divorcing differently because we only hear and we only see on TV the shitty stories. That's, that's the tabloids display. You're, you know, online at the supermarket tabloids are splashed with them. You know, it wasn't, I always say it wasn't until Gwyneth Paltrow and Chris Martin split that someone publicly came out and as much as we like to make fun of it. Right. But we publicly (laughs) came out and talked about conscious uncoupling and radical idea. Way radical. And it happened years after my divorce. So when I got divorced, that was not like, nobody was talking about it. No. And then for me, when I got divorced, I had two young kids. So it was also this idea of really shifting. I I talk about this in the book, instead of saying like, oh, no one's going to want to date me because of all my baggage. I said, okay, how can I change that? How can I shift my thinking? Because self-talk is self-hypnosis. And I said, I am going to meet someone who is going to appreciate all of my experience that I have. And PS, maybe not have pressure to have children, which was great for them. Right. Absolutely. That's what I wrote an article. Oh my gosh. Probably 10 or 12 years ago before I even started my business about why, why you should date a single mom. And that was one of the reasons, like we have kids, like we're not, we're not pressuring you to have babies. (laughs) Totally. Totally. And I know for my husband, my, in, in the relationship I'm in now, which is so wonderful. And people always say like, actually, it's interesting, like to watch words that we use. Of course, we're always talking about this, but people will say, oh, he didn't want his own kids or he doesn't have his own kids. And he always says, I do have my own kids there. And then he names our children. Right. So he never. And so I think there's this assumption that there's mine or yours. And the truth is he was a bit afraid of being able, I think if he had married someone who didn't have kids, he might've been afraid of having children. But with me, I came with the pack, he came with the package and he has just dove into fatherhood in a way that I think he wouldn't have. So I always, he says this to me all the time. Like I always say, Oh, you know, we're, it's such a gift to have you. And he says, Oh, you are all such a gift to me because he wouldn't have been there. Yeah. Oh, sweet. (laughs) 
Yeah, it's possible. Yes. From LA. <laughs> yes. He does. He does. Let's talk. He's from California. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, we'll do a follow up <laughs> episode on that. Yes, exactly. Right. <laughs> but I do think this is so important. Sort of challenging the stigma of divorce, especially when you're when you're going through it. One of the things that makes me so angry is that many states require this co-parenting class mm-hmm. sort of at the end. It's like the last thing you do before you get your divorce, right? It's like, oh, and it's great, except that many of these classes that are state sanctioned, the first thing they do is talk about how terrible divorce is <laughs> and that like really what you're doing is screwing up your kids by going through this. Now, this is like the last thing that you do before like the final papers, right? You just have to take this class and prove that you've taken this class. How on earth is that helpful? And talk about stigma, right? Talk about stigmatizing. There's a great program that I've recently found. They're one of our sponsors, Center for Divorce Education. And their program, they have a great co-parenting program that most states you can opt for. This is like free advertising for them, by the way. Wow. (laughs) <laughs> but because they don't do that, right? They don't, they don't do that. They don't stigmatize it. They're, they they right. take the assumption like, okay, I mean, for God's sake, if you've gotten to that point, right? <laughs> you've already been through all of the grief, all of the guilt, right? Of it, right? Right. And also, you know, research does not support that. Research shows exactly. that it is better for children to be in a home where there is one parent than to be in a home where there's two parents who are constantly fighting all the time. We know that it's developmentally appropriate for kids to think that when there's stress in their house, that there's that they've done something wrong. So it is actually like scientifically wrong also to be doing that despite like being morally awful. Exactly. Exactly. I love that idea of divorce education, the center for, I love that. Right. It even I'm, I'm such a stickler for words being a cognitive behavioral therapist. And I just love the idea of like divorce education. I talk about, you know, getting divorced, kind of like being grad, getting, going to graduate school for relationships, like uplifting you, moving through, going higher. Like, let's talk about that instead of it bringing you lower. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's such an opportunity. Yes. This is an opportunity. I remember I tell the story a lot about this date that I went on early in divorce and the guy had been divorced for two years. And so we were, and I was like newly divorced. And so we're sitting at dinner and I said like, so what happened? They didn't have kids. So what, what happened? Like, what's the, and he's like, I don't know, man, the best I can figure it. She had a psychotic break. She just decided she didn't want to be married to me anymore. (laughs) And that was that. And I was like, in the two years that you've been divorced, You were That's back. your conclusion. <laughs> she had a psychotic break. I'm like, wow. Right. This is the opera. This is the time. This is the exactly. time to like. This is the time. And I, you know, I had this moment where I was sitting in the playground with a bunch of other parents. And one of them said to me, Hey, I don't see your ex that much. Like, what's his deal? And I was like, Okay, ready? Here come the stories. And I just went off. I just said every bad experience and story that had happened. And in the moment they were like nodding and tearing up and being all empathic. And I felt good when I was telling it, when I walked away, I felt like shit because I thought, first of all, that's so painful. Like I, I was telling it like it was a story, but it was actually my story. So ouch, like how, and I wasn't going to move forward at all if I was going to keep telling these stories. And so it was really when I was walking home that day, pushing the stroller, I thought to myself, you've got a choice right now. Like you can focus on his inventory and you can keep telling these stories that are very colorful and very interesting, or you can figure out how the hell you ended up here and why you've been in it for so long. And that, as we've talked about so many times, I can only change me that I can change. So it was an education, honestly, Kate, on me. Yep. I figured out who the hell I was yep. and I stopped trying to figure out who he was. I want to make sure everybody goes and, and like hits the rewind button. You know how like on podcasts, you can like go back 30 seconds, do that and listen to that again. Cause that's really, that's what this is all about. That's what this is all yeah. about. Like we can continue to tell these stories or we can focus on ourselves. Right. Yeah. And that is the choice. That is literally the choice. Um, And I have chills, I have chills because you know what, you know, you and I know from doing this work, that's the moment that is right. 
it, the fork in the road. That is. It absolutely is. It literally is. And by the way, you know, if you read Elizabeth's book, you'll you'll know like there's a there was a lot of inventory for you to take of of his, right? So yes. and and for me too, right? There's a lot that we we're very justified in yes. taking their inventory and in sort of telling the stories of the bad things they've done. But it's still not helpful. No. And in fact, I have a chapter called Righteous Anger. I was and I was literally. Yes, I know. People love that. Great. We're, to, we're, <laughs> we're totally on the same page. Yep. So the reason I bring that up is because I use that phrase in particular. It's righteous anger. Like, girl, dude, like you have got every reason to be angry. And in fact, usually we think of righteous anger with social activism or, you know, some sort of political activism with the word righteous. You have every reason to be angry. I'm sure you do if you've gone through a divorce. I want you to be able to feel that and process it, but I don't want you to push it, either push it down so it comes out sideways or focus your anger on the other person. This is your emotion. Feelings are all excitations in the brain. They have no valence to them. Happiness, joy, surprise, they're the same neurochemicals as anger. So we just need to allow ourselves to feel it. And I specifically talk in the book, really feel it physiologically because we hold trauma in our body and divorce is a trauma. And we need to allow the movement of this energy, this fight response through us. We just need to, in order to be a better parent, to be a better partner to whoever we work with, to be a better citizen in this world. Yeah. How do, so how, how do you recommend people do that? So what I recommend is to think of, or you can use my suggestion, a song that you can listen to that really just makes you feel the rage. So for me, it's Killing in the Name of by Rage Against the Machine. And I put that on and I just want to punch the air. And I was sharing with someone that I actually, the first few times I did it, I noticed I wanted to do this kind of backwards punch where my elbow went behind me. And that is actually a movement I do a lot when I'm releasing anger. I think it's this feeling of get off my back. Actually, I didn't even know I needed that. I took a kickboxing class in the beginning. Did you do that? Oof, that was powerful. And I didn't even picture like the person's face or anything. I just, just the release was so amazing. Right. Oh my God. People always ask me like, how do I get, how do I, how do I get through the anger? How do I express the anger? You know, all of that stuff. And I'm like, go fucking punch a bag. There's nothing more cathartic. Go punch and kick up the shit out of a bag. Don't do like a tie bow air thing. Actually make (laughs) contact. It's amazing. It's amazing. Right. And you can do it on the floor. Sometimes I'll just bang my my feet or bang my fists. Like I also need contact and just to release again, that energy. And there's no, there's no judgment. Feelings aren't facts. As we know, feelings, releasing your rage in your room, listening to music, or I had to do it in the bathroom um, is not going to mean you're going to go out and hurt somebody. In fact, if you do it in your bathroom, you will not, you will not be that person having road rage. You will actually have allowed your anger and your righteous anger. So please, as, as a gift to anyone who knows you, let yourself feel your anger and the safety of your home. I, I, lo- I love that. And I think it's so important. I think it speaks to also like toxic masculinity, how we don't, when we do not allow our feelings out specifically through our body, they, it does come out, but it comes out, as you said, sideways, it comes out with guns. It comes out with punching your wife, it, like whatever it is, right. It, it'll yeah. come out. Yeah. Passive, ag- passive aggression. You know, I hear, you know, people say all the time, which by the way, I just want to say, I think we need to rephrase pass- being passive aggressive as aggressive. There's nothing yeah. passive about it. Right. But I, I tell this story about how I, w- you know, I would go to court. I w- we were, in, we were in litigation. So I would go to family court and I would hear like the door would open when the court officer would come. And so you could kind of hear what was happening in the case that was finishing up. And I would sometimes hear women in particular shrieking, like, how could you do this? You are so horrible to their ex. And I have to tell you, I was jealous. I was like, damn, I want to do that. Like, I want to just release my anger and my rage. And my lawyer would say, I mean, she kind of pat me on the knee and she would say, when you get home, when you get home. And it was 
it, so the urge to lose it is totally understandable. The question is, where are you doing it? Because how does it end up hurting you? If I had raged like that, but, you know, unfortunately these, we know from the, you know, that these judges very much, many of them are sexist. And so they're going to think, oh, a hysterical woman. And, right. and then that's it. Right. And so I was saving myself my, when I, when I didn't lose it, but I understand, I just want to say to people, like, I understand the desire to lose your shit. Totally. Totally. But court is not the appropriate place, place. because even if the judge isn't sexist, they'll like, oh, you can't actually, you're not, you're not taking necessary steps. Right. Right. You're not actually taking necessary steps to mm. heal and present yourself. If you can't hold it together in court. Yeah. Right. Like I think that whether totally. you're right. And many, most, most, most judges are not sexist. Most of them are kind and loving <laughs> and you're exactly right. It's a sign that you're not fully taking care of yourself and you won't be able to make the good, good decisions. When you clear out your anger in that way, you allow your emotional part of your brain, your amygdala and your frontal cortex to communicate more clearly. And that's what we need during a divorce. We have to make so many decisions. We have to make so many choices. We want to have as much clear thinking as we can. And now we're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor today. Today's sponsor is Soberlink. Now, the Soberlink system is designed to make parenting time safer with real-time remote alcohol monitoring. Soberlink uniquely combines a breathalyzer with wireless connectivity and is the only system that includes facial recognition, tamper detection, and advanced reporting. Parents can submit a test anytime, anywhere, thanks to Soberlink's wireless technology, which delivers test results by text message or email to the concerned parties. Simplify co-parenting arrangements by using the system that provides transparency and proof of sobriety throughout the day. Flexible schedules combined with real-time delivery of results make Soberlink the experts in remote alcohol monitoring technology. And for limited time, get $50 off your device by emailing info at Soberlink.com and mentioning the Divorce Survival Guide. And now back so to the show. So let's, let's talk about the amygdala and the, and the prefrontal cortex so that we just, so that people under, I mean, you and I know what we're talking about, but just in case. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. What question and why is it important? Yeah. So during a trauma, and again, I, I consider divorce a trauma because a trauma is anything that is different from what you're used to. So you're driving along and things are going okay. And then boom, something happens, something that happens unexpectedly. Do you refer, do you think of that Kate as a trauma going through a divorce? Absolutely. And yeah. I think also everything leading up to it, right? Like, yes, it's, there are so many, there were so many traumas that led you to this moment. And then yes, there's everything else after it too. So it's, it's, it's multiple. Yeah. You know. Great. Right. Just want to make sure for you to say something about that too. So in trauma, what ends up happening is like everything, we, we think that we only process things in our mind and our thinking mind, but we process it in our entire body. So in our brain, the base of our brain, the oldest, most primitive part of our brain is called our amygdala. That's where we have emotions. And it's not very discerning. It's like bleh, sadness, bleh, anger, bleh. like it's just very primitive. It's, it's the oldest part of our brain. It's a it's mammalian part. Sometimes is referred to as the reptilian brain or the lizard brain, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And then we have the frontal cortex. We have lots of other parts of the brain, but to, for our example, we're going to talk about the frontal cortex, which is the front of a brain, which is really like the CEO. It's the more rational. It's the, the old, it's the newer part of our brain that has us say, for example, oh, maybe I shouldn't lose my shit at court because the judge might consider that behavior negative. Like it's a part of you that can rationalize, that can delegate, that can make choices. And so what happens when things are going great, our emotional part of our brain connects with our frontal cortex. For example, when we used to go to work, we'd come home from work, be pissed off at something our coworker did, come home, see our partner, you know, hasn't cleaned the kitchen yet, feel frustrated, you know, get ready to get upset with them and then say, oh, you know what? I just had a really bad day. Let me go take a shower. That's the moment where your frontal cortex comes in and says, okay, emotion and lizard brain, there's a reason for this. There's context. Let's go do something else. Yep. When you go through a trauma, those two parts of your brain don't communicate. There is a 
break in that. And so your ability to rationalize and understand your emotions and basically be logical is, is deeply impaired. Mm -hmm. And so we need to do a ton of things to help that lizard brain come down from its flare up so that the logical part of your brain can, as I like to call it, will come back online. Yeah. And it really is the difference between the woman screaming bloody murder in the courtroom and your attorney saying later, right? Like your attorney's almost- She was my frontal lobes. Exactly. Right. (laughs) Totally. And I think, Kate, don't you think that that's some of the work we do with people? We are the frontal lobes. hundred percent. Yes. Right. And it's not dismissing the emotion, right? Right. It's contextualizing the emotion and creating the proper response, outlet and response, right? Exactly, exactly. And it's allowing you to have, I guess the the thing people often talk about is like perspective. Like I've lost all perspective. And we talk about it with kids. We talk about like popping the lid, like the lid just goes pop off the pot and I can't. And, And it's really important. It's okay if that happens again, righteous anger, it makes sense. But that's when you need to ask for someone like Kate or me or your lawyer or your me for help, for guidance, for that frontal lobes. So I think it's really important to know that we, we, we want that to communicate those two parts to communicate. And often it's hard during a divorce. Yeah. And I know that I noticed with my clients, I wonder if you notice with this, with yours too, is that sometimes they get really confused. They're like, wait, is this, is I'm, I'm rationalizing this, but wait a minute, does that mean I'm like giving, giving away the farm? Am I giving up? Am I like, right? Because we get confused about, because of the trauma, trauma confuses us. Yes. Confusion is a huge symptom. It's, it's um, one of the symptoms of, of trauma is what we call dissociation, which is, and most people think of that as kind of out of your body. It's been shown in movies to be like, you know, watching your body from above, but confusion is an, is a way of dissociating. It's a way of not being grounded. And I always tell people you never have to make a decision right in this moment. Yep. You can always say, I need 24 hours to think about it. Let me talk to my advisors about that. Yep. Thanks for asking. I need a minute. Mm-hmm. Once you understand how the frontal cortex works, you can start noticing that confusion that you mentioned. And Kate, I see that a lot. And know that that's a trigger to give yourself some more time. Confusion is a state. It's not, you know, I think we feel, I'm sure you see this all the time with, should I stay or should I go? It's not like I should go. I should stay. There's this other thing of, I don't know. I'm confused. Right. Mm -hmm. That's actually a state. Yes, absolutely. It's paralysis. It's right. Yeah. And, and, and self-doubt and like, oh, but is that, is that, I, I work a lot with inner critics you know, the inner critic Mm -hmm. side, right? So this is, yeah. and so sometimes people get really, really confused. Like, I don't know, is that a critic voice or is that my guide voice? Like, I I can't, I can't tell. Right, right. And sometimes for me, that certainly happens for me too. I get confused and I have to take time. And usually when I'm confused, it's because I'm moving too fast. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right. And I think in a divorce, I don't know about you, but I know my lawyer really made me feel like everything was urgent. Like get back to me right away. I remember. And I, I really had to slow her down a lot. Yes. I'm so glad you said that. I think that's a, yeah. really, I think it's a really important thing is that I, and the one thing I keep t- telling my clients is don't forget they work for you. Right. If you, people will say to me, like, I don't know, can I, can I tell the, can I slow down? Like, it feels like it's moving too fast, but like, I don't know. My attorney says, I'm like, yeah, no, they work for you. If yeah. this doesn't work for you, if you want to put a pin in this for three months while you sort through your emotions, yes, you can. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> well, that's what's so good about having someone like you to work with when you're going through this, because I think a lot, I mean, I, I I'm always, every day that I do this work, I'm more and more convinced about the need of a team because everyone has their piece that they need to take care of. Like if I had to wake up tomorrow and pay my taxes, I'd be screwed. I'm not a CPA. I don't know how to do that. Right. Like the lawyer doesn't know how to take, and all of our friends are like mediators. Like we don't know how to take care of the emotions. We're not a coach. We're not a therapist. Please do that with the right person. And then you can show up to us and we can do our work. But, But you are not like your lawyer is not, is not in charge of you. Like you're the boss of you. You're the boss. You're the boss of the process. You're the boss. Yeah. Totally the boss of the process. 100. And there's no wrong way to do the process. If you're working with someone and they're telling you there's a right way and a wrong way, then they're not your person. Right. 
And it's hard for women who, I mean, I, I say women because it's hard for anyone who has yeah. felt so disempowered throughout their entire yes. marriage to suddenly be like, oh, no, no, you have the power. Go ahead and take it from this like really powerful, strong attorney. <laughs> yes. Well, like, totally. And I want to say also, I have to throw this in as a shrink. One of the things that's so fascinating to me is our unconscious draw to people who we know. So very often we find lawyers, even divorce coaches who mimic yep. our old relationship it all the time. <laughs> Fascinating, right? That lawyer sounds a lot like your husband. Hmm. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it's totally understandable. It's like have you, at work, we do this too. You end up having a boss who's just like your mother. Like it's this unconscious draw, just so you know, you know, you haven't done anything wrong, but we just want to recognize it and then figure out how you want to act with it. Because the lawyer, you can choose whether you want to be in a relationship with them or not. The divorce coach, you can choose. There's so many and who have so many different styles. What's the right style for you? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up because it is yeah. so true. I see it all the time. Right. The time. It's like interesting that you chose another aggressive male who's diminishing your needs. And exactly. Needs exactly. <laughs> exactly. And actually, Kate, you are going to love this because in my book, um, in the chapter I have about dating again, I created something called the relationship pattern excavator, Ooh. where before you start dating, yeah. And I'm happy to share the bonnet that with your audience, even if they don't buy the book, I can share it with you them. No problem. Um, be happy to. Yeah. And basically what I say, and this is apply, I hadn't thought about this applies to the lawyers too. It's like, let's do a very compassionate analysis, a really beautiful, just looking at curious examination of how you've been in relationships. What kind of people are you attracted to? What kind of people are you wanting to spend your time with? And how has that worked for you? No judgment, like zero judgment. I don't know if I've told this story on your podcast before, but my first, the first person I dated and like kissed right after my divorce was this guy. I was having such a good time with him. We were hanging out. This was like our first date. I met him at a wedding, of course. And then we went to, we hung out a few days later. We're hanging out, we're having some wine. And he says to me, you're a psychiatrist by the way, I'm a psychologist, but okay. <laughs> and he said, can you, um, can you, so that mean you can prescribe me clonopin and Xanax and Ativan? So I was like, ha, 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 ha. Kept drinking, had a great time, had a really fun night, stayed over. Next morning, went to sit my ass in a church basement of Al-Anon and laughed at myself when I realized what had happened. Like here I was like with another addict, like this, I had, I had, I mean, I, it was just remarkable to me. And I thought that was so awesome because that was information for me. Like I keep finding this, this keeps getting, I'm drawn to this. What's going on for me lovingly and compassionately. And that's, and I think that's the key, right? The loving compassion rather than like, what the fuck is wrong with me? And like beating totally. yourself up for it because here's the deal. It took you one date, <laughs> one date. Maybe you slept over, maybe you had fun, like all that. Right? <laughs> It took you maybe 24 hours for it to sink yeah. in, but 24 hours was a hell of a lot better than however many years you were married to an addict. <laughs> totally. And he taught me so much, this guy. I'm so grateful to him because he taught me this pattern that I had. And he told me on the first date, like it was all so great. It was such, it was so wonderful. And then, then I was really able to start figuring out what I didn't have in relationships. Like I didn't know that men in my, in my case, as I'm heterosexual could be humble. So humility became like the deal breaker for me. And that, then there were all these other men that I had never literally seen because humility wasn't something that was important to me. But when I started looking for that, I thought, oh, this guy's, oh, okay. There was a whole new group of people. Interesting. I like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sex mm -hmm. day. <laughs> exactly. Nothing sexier than like, sorry, I made a mistake. I mean, are you kidding me? It's like oh my, my favorite God. thing in the world. I know. Right? Yeah. So we talk about in the book about creating a map of the things that are deal breakers to you. And they're not like, you know, call it whatever the things you typically think height, weight or whatever. They're like willing to work on themselves, yeah. humble, curious in therapy. Like <laughs> that's a deal breaker for me. That is a, in therapy. a deal breaker for me. Therapy. Love it. To be in therapy. Like yeah. I love it. sometimes the people see on like dating apps, someone will say something like, sort of say like, Hey, you know, Hey, I'm in, I'm in therapy. I hope that's not a turnoff or something. And I'm like, are you kidding? Right. Like nothing if, sexier. There is nothing sexier. Well, because also for the, you and I, who've been in these codependent relationships, like 
the fact that you can talk to someone else about your shit. Thank God. Like I used to love when my husband went to therapy, I was like, Oh, it's Wednesday. I think we're going to talk about what just happened on Tuesday. So that means Wednesday night, we always have these deep conversations, you know, like I don't have to do the work girl. Like what? Great. Exactly. Oh, love that. So, (laughs) um, you all, I'm going to stick to the heavy stuff. You also talk about grief and loss. You have a chapter on yeah. grief and loss. I mean, you have I chapters do. on, let me just say that we also have chapters yeah. on the formula for creating the life you love. We have, you have a chapter on seven self-care behaviors, seven pleasure tools, right? So, and then the final chapter on living in the afterglow. So, yeah. I, but I am touching on the harder things in this. Great. Book. That's where I go. Perfect. The grief and loss, because these are, the, these are the hard things, right? These are the things that are hard for people. Yeah. So how do you help people in the book and obviously in your work yeah. through the grief and the loss? Because it's real and it's one of the hardest things, I think. I think that's right. I think it's just like the anger. I think you first have to start with acknowledging that it's there and that it, I don't know for you, Kate, but for me, it's a process. It is a process of unpeeling and dealing with the loss over time. I share the story in the book that about three or four years ago, my ex-husband came with his son. So my children's half brother to our country house. So it was my ex-husband, his four-year-old son and my two, our two kids and me. And we were swimming in the pool. My husband was like making a barbecue or something. And they were swimming along and my, one of the really, and I talk about this in co-parenting, like a very, I've spent a lot of time thinking about positive aspects of my ex-husband so that I can share them with my kids. And he's a very funny, fun, imaginative person. So we're having this really fun game in the pool. And I suddenly stopped and felt really sad. And I had this moment where I thought, shit, like, I don't want to be married to him right now, but there was a time when this is what I wanted. Uh Uh-huh. Absolutely. And I have to grieve that. And I thought, damn it. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to feel it. Another right. Layer. Another layer. Another 10 years layer. later, another layer. You're, you're got a whole new life. There's yeah. another layer. There's another yeah. layer. And you, and I just allowed it to be perfectly honest. I went inside. I cried. I told my husband, I told a friend and I just felt the feelings of grief and loss. And I have an exercise in the book where I suggest that people really write the fantasy that they had. Like we have to acknowledge what we thought, even if you hate the person, there was a moment Mm -hmm. where you thought this was going to be who you wanted to spend the rest of your life with. So write that story. And then we do this ritual while I have them transfer it to a tissue paper because tissue paper, when you burn it really beautifully, and then you release it, but you have to acknowledge that that was your wish at one time. I think a lot of people, Kate, deny that part. And that's the problem. I, yes, I think that's right. And I think you also tell a story in a book and in the book. And I I hear this from clients and people in my Facebook group 24 seven. I wanted this. This was my choice. I'm the one who wanted this. Why am I feeling all of this grief? I'm not supposed to. I'm the, like, I I thought this is what I wanted. Exactly. Because we don't allow in this culture for us to have two feelings at one time. We don't allow for us ourselves. And I know you preach this all the time, right? To have what I like to call the golden and like for the love of God and the goddess, why can't we feel both grateful we ended and sad that we ended? Why can't you have, we have multiple feelings at the same time. You're allowed to have two conflicting emotions. You are like, that's part of the human, human experience. That's that's the beauty of being a human, right? Absolutely. And yes. so absolutely. So, and, and again, even in, when you ask me that question in that question, in that statement that people are saying, there's so much shame. Like I talk in my program about the women in my program are super women. I think you are a fucking superhero, man. I mean, you are unbelievable what you've gone through. Either you accepted that someone wanted a divorce, which is incredibly painful and, and strong and brave, or you decided this shit isn't working for me. That's incredibly brave. So there's, there's no, really, there's no room when you're a superhero for shame. There's only room for compassion. And so if I just want to let your listeners know that they are so brave, they are doing the hard work and the more compassionate they can be, they can bring an ounce of compassion that they give to other people, to themselves. This whole process will be so much easier. Amen, sister. Mm. Amen, sister. I feel like we should leave it there. Is there anything else you feel like people should know about 
your book. When is it, when does it come out? What's the date? It comes out April 20th. It's available for pre-order now. If people before April 20th, if you want to go to my website, drelizabethcohen.com backslash books and book, then you will get enrolled in free three free bonus workshops um, that I've never done before. So you're, if you do that now, otherwise it's available, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and also it's available on bookshop. And I just want to encourage people. That's a conglomerate of independent bookstores. Let's buy it there. Let's do that. <laughs> let's buy it there. Let's do that. Um, yes, let's do that. That's great. And all of that information will be in the show notes. Great. And where can people find you? You can find me on my website, drelizabethcohen.com, which is drelizabethcohen.com. And I'm here to answer and help and support any questions and any way that I can. I love doing this work. I'm doing this work. Now, I want people to know, I do believe that if we heal the trauma of divorce, especially women are going to change this world. Like if we can release this trauma, watch out world. Amen. Again, amen, sister. Thank you so much for coming on, Elizabeth. I love talking to you. I, I love the work that you're doing. I love your book. I you. just so psyched to have you in my orbit and everyone needs to go and pre-order this book and it comes out on April 20th. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at The Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.